Hi. Today I'm going to talk to you about the future of communications and the importance of the second mobile cellular license to the Bahamas. We're going to go over Cable Bahamas, Who Are We?, Communication Trends in Future, Communications and the Bahamas, the Government Mobile Requirements, and why should Cable Bahamas be awarded the second mobile cellular license in the Bahamas? So let's start a little bit about our history. Everybody says, you know, you don't know where you're going unless you know where you come from. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about where it is that we've come from and where it is that we are going. In 1994, Cable Bahamas was awarded the first license for cable television. In 1995, March the 7th, we signed up our first customer in South Beach in New Providence. In 1996, we launched premium television and pay-per-view services in the Bahamas. In 1999, Cable Bahamas introduced broadband. This is the first time broadband came to the Bahamas, and it was introduced by Cable Bahamas. My son is 13 years old, and he does not know a world where there is not broadband internet. He doesn't understand the concept of dial-up or the concept of not being online 24-7. An entire generation of Bahamian citizens have grown up without understanding that concept and this is one of the things that Cable Bahamas has brought to the country. In 2001, Cable Bahamas entered the telecom market. We landed the first fiber brought by ship, submerged in the, the bed of the ocean and landed it on the west coast of New Providence at Caves Point, making us the second telecoms provider in the country and the first telecoms provider to provide that service via fiber optic cable. In 2005, we launched HD and digital television. In 2009, very important point for our country's history in the telecommunications sector was that telecoms was deregulated. In 2010, for Cable Bahamas, one of the most important points in our history. We had 27% of our shares that were outstanding and held by a foreign company. <coughs> Cable Bahamas purchased those shares back and we became a 100% Bahamian-owned company. In 2011, we entered the fixed-line telephony market, launching Rev Voice. And in 2014, Cable Bahamas expanded its operations into the United States, uh, becoming an international player in the telecoms market. So, where is our current position today? We are the market leader in video, broadband, and data business. We are the first triple play provider, providing video, voice, and data. We have 27% of the landline voice market. Now, what is significant about that is that Cable Bahamas is the first provider to come into an incumbent market, a market where there has already been a telecom provider providing landline voice services, compete, and within three years gain 27% market share where no other company has achieved more than 16% market share after 12 to 15 years. We provide television services to 79,000 television customers. We provide broadband to 54,000 broadband customers, and we provide voice to 27,000 voice customers, 30,000 lines in total. We have a disaster recovery center both in Grand Bahama and in New Providence. Now, what is that? We back up the data for the largest financial institutions in the country, both in banking and in the financial sector, as well as some segments of the Bahamas government. What does that mean? In the event of a natural disaster, a hurricane, we have had banks and financial institutions actually come to our premises and continue working as if nothing has happened, because all of their data is there, their phone lines are transferred, and they're up and running. That's what we do at Cable Bahamas. We are the market leader in video, broadband, and data. We've had consistent revenue growth. In tw 2013, our revenue was $112 million. We are on target to meet our 2014 projections. Our market capitalization is over $200 million. Now, what does that mean? You take all of the outstanding shares of Cable Bahamas and you multiply that by the cost of the share in the market today. Today, the market price uh, was $14.44. We have a balance sheet of over $350 million. Let's talk to you a little bit about what it is that we have. 
What is our infrastructure? What is it that we provide to the country? When Cable Bahamas built its network, we said from the very beginning that we were going to have a continuous build, <coughs> continuous network build. Today we have invested over $400 million in our network. We have a reliable telecom network with an international and metro hubs in Grand Bahama and in New Providence with a self-healing ring. What does that mean? In the event of some sort of a disaster in the ocean, a ship drops anchor and cuts our fiber optics in half, the traffic going on that fiber optic cable just turns around and goes in the other direction. With only a 50 millisecond latency, you won't even notice that it's occurred. We have high rel reliability service level agreements, 24 hour customer support. We have local, national, and international fiber. Cable Bahamas has laid over 1,000 kilometers of submarine fiber connecting the islands, Nassau, Abaco, Grand Bahama, and Eleuthera back to the United States with multiple fibers in order to create the network that we have created. We have put down 2,500 kilometers of terrestrial fiber. That's the fiber that's on all of the islands in the Bahamas that we currently have fiber optic services. 2,500 kilometers of fiber. Now, what I want to do right now is I want to take you through a map of the Bahamas and show you a little bit of where it is that we have our network and the type of network that we have. So there's a lot of mythology around Cable Bahamas, its network, and where Cable Bahamas covers today. One of the things that I want to do right now is to do some myth busting. Let's, bi let's bust that mythology. Let's start with uh, Great Anagua in the south, and we're going to go all the way up to Bimini, and then we're going to go into Florida. You're going to see, th you see three different colors here. We have green, we have uh, orange, and we have blue. The green represents where we have head ends. Head ends are uh, facilities where we have satellite dish farms. We bring in the signal and then we distribute it by fiber optic cables to the different neighborhoods in the country. And then from the neighborhood we take coax into the household. In the orange sections, you'll see these are off-air antennas. They are connected by fiber optic cables where we transmit six channels that is distributed free of charge to anyone within that antenna range. Those towers cost between $250,000, $300,000 and Cable Bahamas uh, puts them up and maintains them. If there's a hurricane, they go down, Cable Bahamas puts them back up again. again there is no revenue gained in those areas. We have today 14 free-to-air antennas throughout the Bahamas. So I'm going to go through the, the chain of islands. We're going to start here with Great Anagua, where we have a head end. In Meguana, we have a free-to-air broadcast system. In Acklands, in Crooked Island, we have a free-to-air broadcast system. In Long Island, we have a head end. Right next to it, Ragged Island, we have a free-to-air broadcast system that also bleeds over into Long Island. We have a free-to-air in Rum Key, and we have a head-end in San Salvador. In Cat Island, we have a, a free-to-air broadcast system both on the uh, northern side and the southern side of Cat Island. In Great Exuma, we have a head-end, but to the north in Great Exuma, we have a free-to-air broadcast system. In Eleuthera, to the south, we have a free-to-air broadcast system, but you see, this is where our network begins in the, in the four main islands where the largest population is located, Nassau, Abaco, Grand Bahama, and Eleuthera, which is connected by submarine fiber, which you can see here in blue, that is also then connected to the United States. You'll see that this fiber goes all along the, the, the terrestrially along Eleuthera, uh, along Abaco, Grand Bahama, and in the New Providence. Let's move now to uh, Andros. Andros, which is the largest island, we have four different facilities. In the north part of Andros, we have a head end. In the north part of Andros, we also have a free-to-air broadcast system. Central Andros, we have a head end. And southern Andros, we have a free-to-air broadcast system. In Grand Bahama on the east end, even though we do have uh, 
our network in Grand Bahama and the areas of East End where we don't reach with our network, we also have a free-to-air broadcast system. Also in Moores Island, the Berry Islands, we have a head end, and Bimini, we have a head end. Today, Cable Bahamas covers 99% of the Bahamian population. You can combine Comcast and Time Warner in the United States, and they don't cover 99% of the United States. Just to put that into perspective. Now you see the blue fiber goes into Boca Raton, Florida on one side and North Miami Beach on the other side. That fiber then moves from a terrestrial to a terrestrial fiber going around Orlando coming back down into Bonita Springs, Naples, Marco Island. This is where we have extended our network in 2014. In 2013, we were in front of 350,000 subscribers in the Bahamas. Today, we're in front of 16,350,000 subscribers, including the Bahamas and Florida. In Florida, we are part of one of the largest hotel markets on the planet, serving the largest hotel market being Orlando, Florida, with television services and broadband services. So where are we? And where are we going? How many people here remember the brick phones? The big brick phones that you used to carry around either in a suitcase or you carry it around on your arm. I remember them very well. My father had this alarm company, 24-hour uh, monitoring. So we always needed to have this phone and this connectivity. And my brother carried this huge phone along with him. The very first mobile phone call was made from New York City in 1973. Nokia did not put out its first portable phone until 1982. Then 1999, we jumped forward and the BlackBerry Nation was born. Everybody had email. Everybody had email and everybody was mobile. We move forward to 2007. 2007, that's only seven years ago, is when the touchscreen phone was invented. 2007 was when the first touch screen phone came out. That's seven years, guys. This is how quickly technology has evolved. By 2008, there were one billion internet users, 600 million mobile users. Facebook had 200 million mobile users by 2009. There were four billion mobile subs. By 2014, just five years later, there were 1.4 billion Facebook users and 1.2 billion of them was on mobile. 2015, 2015, there are over 5 billion mobile users in the world today. It's not a matter of technology. It's a matter of what people want. They want anything, anywhere, anytime, and on any device. There is an unlimited demand for broadband. It's a digital world. Everything is IP. Everything is cloud-based. They want it now. 4G, LTE, fast, speed, low latency. Everything is over the top. I looked at my phone the other day. They, I have nine applications on this device today that I can place a phone call with. And only one of them is connected to the mobile carrier in the country. How many of you here have a smartphone? OK. Let's do a little test. What percentage of your time is spent making local phone calls with your cell carrier versus using broadband? Give me some numbers. 50-50? Uh, 60-40? 80-20? 90-10? We're getting in that range. So 90% of your time is spent making, doing broadband activity on your mobile device, 10% on the phone. Mobile and fixed termination rates are going to drop. Why? Because the technology has changed. It is no longer about making a phone call. It is all about data. In 1999, 15% of the world's population had a mobile phone. In 2009, 70% of the world's population had a mobile phone. Cable Bahamas. We have world-class broadband. A cable modem can give you broadband services up to 100 megabits per second. We have fiber virtually everywhere. The Bahamas must keep pace. Mobile must improve and be the springboard for growth. The second mobile cellular license is supposed to be awarded on the 1st of May, but public involvement is necessary. 
because your voice is important to be heard in the market. Who do you want to be the next mobile provider? Do you think that your opinion counts in this entire environment about who should be the next mobile carrier in the country? I think it does. Let's take a look at the telecom market. Today, the, tele the Bahamas telecom market is, is valued at $435 million to the end of 2012. Cable Bahamas is excluded from 55% of that market. In the market that we're able to compete with, that 45% that that's left over, BTC has 26%, excuse me, 16%, and Cable Bahamas has 26%. In the areas where we can compete with the local telecom company, we beat them. Why? Because we have a better network. So let's talk about what are the stipulations that the government has laid out. A new co has to be established. So a new company that's 49% owned by whoever is going to be the applicant that gets the award, and 51% by the Bahamas government until those shares are sold to the Bahamian people. They're going to be held in trust. We passed the RFP, RFP phase where everybody was able to get the RFP, take a look at it. There were nine companies. Three came back and said, we want to apply for this mobile license, Cable Bahamas being one of them. The next phase is the Spectrum auction. We don't have the date yet for that auction, but that's where the bids are going to come in to decide what is the cost for that Spectrum that's going to allow whatever company it is that wins to run their network. First week in May is when it's supposed to be awarded. So who are the companies that's bidding? Cable Bahamas, a Bahamian company, 100%. Digicel, an Irish company. And Virgin Mobile, a British company. Why should Cable Bahamas get the license? Well, let's talk a little bit about what Cable Bahamas is. Cable Bahamas is a 100% Bahamian company. We have over 500 Bahamian employees. To date, we have paid over $127 million in dividends. $127 million in dividends. Our service quality is second to none. Our recent surveys of over 1,200 cable customers have come back and says <laughs> that your ranking for broadband is 96% favorability rating amongst broadband customers. Your customer service is between 85% and 95% customer service satisfaction. Yes, there are always uh, room for improvement. There's always room for improvement and Cable Bahamas continues to improve through their training, through their human resources, through morale boosting. Training is a very essential part of our organization. Innovation. We've brought out video applications. We're the first triple play provider in the country. Our technical expertise, we have a fiber backbone that connects the four islands, Nassau, Abaco, Grand Bahama, and Eleuthera back to the United States. In May, the largest construction project in the Western Hemisphere is going to be launching. That's Bahamar. Without the backbone that Cable Bahamas provides to the Bahamas. Do you think that that multi-billion dollar investment would have been possible? Do you think the expansion of Atlantis would have been possible? Those two companies together will be the second and third largest employers in the country and they are enabled by a communication and infrastructure that Cable Bahamas has put in place. Affordability. Let's talk a little bit about our plans. Around the world, we grade the cost per megabit for broadband. The world ranking for cost per megabit, and this changes on a daily basis, just like currency. The price is somewhere around the neighborhood of $5.50 per megabit around the world. The United States is somewhere in the neighborhood of $3.50. Canada, around $3.40 per megabit. Cable Bahamas' introduction broadband rate is $1.99 per megabit, going down to $1.41 per megabit. Let's take a look at television. If you were to take a look at our television packages, you take basic. The nearest competitor in North America 
that includes the United States and Canada, is 227% the cost of Cable Bahamas' basic rate. If you were to take Cable Bahamas' basic rate and its second package, which will be the, the, the amount of channels that matches up with what North America offers in their first tier, we are 200%. They are 200% more expensive than Cable Bahamas. This is why we believe that Cable Bahamas should get the next license. Cable Bahamas, together, we are Bahamian. We are 100% Bahamian. We believe that we are ready. We have the network. We have the expertise. Today, Cable Bahamas has 75% of the broadband market in the country. 75% of the broadband market. What's going to make this device work? What's going to make this device better? Cable Bahamas' network. The fiber that comes into the Bahamas today, on one fiber there are 24 strands. Today, Cable Bahamas' entire network is being run off two of those 24 strands. We have unlimited capacity. We can take that data that's coming from each and every cell tower and backhaul it quicker than any of our competitors are able to do so. Why? Because we have the most fiber-rich network in the country. We're ready. Turn us on. But we need your help. We need your voice to get out there and say that Cable Bahamas should be the next provider. One, because they're ready. And two, because they're ready and they are Bahamian, they should get the next license. Thank you very much. I'm happy to accept questions. Uh, any questions? Yes. Yes. Um, what is the estimated amount of time between the government issuing the license and Cable Bahamas being able to roll out the actual product? Well, provided that Cable Bahamas does in fact get the license, uh, there is a rollout schedule in there for six months for uh, New Providence and Grand Bahama. Of course, all of that is dependent on the, uh, all of the proper approvals from town planning and everything like that to get the network up and going. Hi, you mentioned having the infrastructure in place to be able to provide the mobile service. Um, how do you plan to go about installing what's necessary to switch over to include that service? Well, what you're going to have to do is build um, uh, massive tower bases and bring in towers. We're going to need a lot of cranes. I actually got a business card from someone in uh, Grand Bahama the other day uh, for their crane service to say, when you're ready, please come to us. So it's going to provide a lot of work for uh, people locally in the construction business, uh, in the crane business, and things like that. But it's going to require a tremendous amount of mobilization. What's necessary to be able to provide that service, given that you do have the infrastructure in place? Well, the towers are necessary. Of course, all of the work in terms of designing the, uh, where the towers are going to be based on the topography has been done over the past few years. Of course, we're going to be bringing in uh, the same way as Merlion would bring in the expertise to run each and every one of his hotels, whether it's Marriott or whatever the other hotel would be. We would bring in expertise that will run the network for the first few years. At the same time, train the between 150 and 250 employees that need to be hired uh, to run this network in the Bahamas. Uh, I've heard something in the news about infrastructure sharing. What's that about? Uh, I think it was in December uh, of last year, ERCA uh, put out a document uh, requesting uh, feedback from the public on whether or not mobile operators should share their infrastructure. Uh, there are some um, ups and, and downs uh, on both sides of the coin. Now, of course, We've, been, we've known since 2009 that uh, the uh, market was going to be liberalized. Uh, unfortunately, not until uh, December after everyone already had done all of their designs of the network um, was when this was uh, proposed. But what does it mean exactly? It means that uh, their suggestion is that instead of building brand new uh, mobile networks, that 
everybody piggies back on top of the network that has already been built by VTC. Um, in some instances, that may be good, let's say uh, in the family islands and so forth, but what the design that uh, Cable Bahamas has created is a design which is a brand new design. The design that uh, BBC uh, created was back in 1998. Um, and. Uh, so much has changed since then. Uh, they've al also been filling in the network to, uh, to prevent some of the drop calls. I think the number is somewhere around 40,000 a day. Uh, and we're trying to build a network that is not going to have that type of pitfalls, if you will. So the concept that Cable Bahamas always has is to build our own infrastructure. So if you take a look at our broadband network, we have 75% of the market because we have a better network. We built a better network from the ground up. We started with a hybrid fiber coax system back in 1995. Uh, and that's the basically the type of system that uh, BTC is trying to build now with the next gen network. So we're trying to stay ahead of the game, trying to build a network that is going to have all of the future proofing that's required. Uh, Understanding now that we're building a network not just for telephone calls, but we're building a network that is for data. Thanks, it's a great question. You have a question over here? Um, okay, so if, should Urca rule that you do have to, in fact, share the infrastructure, what are, are some of the challenges that you anticipate? Well, there are a number of challenges. Um, I think it's also has been in the public record that over the past three years, uh, CNW has designed all of their towers uh, that they built in the last three years to only be able to hold one type or one uh, set of infrastructure, which means that each and every single one of those towers need to be retrofitted with a completely new design. Um, and we're not even sure whether or not that's possible. Uh, so it, what it means is that where we're saying that we're ready, turn us on, the concept of being able to get turned on immediately is really not feasible. You're talking about a long protracted period of time before you will be able to have another mobile carrier in the country. Hello again. You mentioned that the phase two would include a spectrum auction. auction. Yes. Can you explain what that is? Well, what that means, every uh, mobile carrier, there are frequencies that are sold so that you can transmit wireless, that you can uh, transmit uh, mobile, where you can transmit data. Uh, so you have 3G, you have 4G, you have 700 megahertz, you have 800 megahertz. And so there's a specific auction for a range of uh, data that's being auctioned, and that will be sold by IRCA um, based on bids. Hi. What's the difference between what Cable Bahamas is providing and the other two competitors? Well, there are three bidders. There's Cable Bahamas, the Digicel, and uh, Virgin uh, Mobile. Um, we can start well with Cable Bahamas. Uh, our plans is to have ubiquitous uh, coverage. We want to build towers that's large enough, tall enough to ensure that um, uh, we are transmitting uh, within the range that everybody uh, can get proper coverage. We don't have drop calls. Um, so, and our network, of course, is being built with the most amount of fiber for backhauling the data to ensure that we have the best data on your phone, which we know is the future of this device. Um, on the other end, you do have uh, Digicel. They have a tremendous amount of, of expertise in the field. They've been in the market uh, about as long as Cable Bahamas has been in the market as a telecom provider, as a matter of fact. Um, and then you have uh, Virgin Mobile. Virgin Mobile has never built a network. I don't know what their plans are here, but they are typically known as an MVNO. An MVNO is a mobile carrier that comes in and they resell data uh, that another, pr uh, excuse me, they resell mobile services that another carrier has. So if they are to uh, continue in the same path that they have in all of their rollouts in the United States and Europe and so forth, what they will do is they will just resell BTC service. 
Uh, so then you, then you come back, if that's not a model that, that we want to look at as, as a Bahamian society, you look back and then you have two, two operators. One is Cable Bahamas and the other is uh, Digicel that both will build new networks, not necessarily new towers in the case of Digicel because they are in fact interested in the uh, infrastructure sharing. So we took a look at it and we saw that uh, it's a $435 million market. Uh, of that, about $280 million of that is, uh, is mobile. Let's say that you were to split that 50-50 and the new entrant were to get 50%, you're talking about um, $140 million in revenue, of which 50% of that, $70 million, will leave the country every year. So the, 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 the choices that we believe is that if a Bahamian can do the same job as someone from another country, all things being equal, the Bahamian should get the job. And that's really the position that we're putting forward. We're not saying that Digicel can't do it. We're saying that we also can do it and we have the infrastructure, and we have everything already in place. We've proven ourselves not just as a Bahamian company, but we've proven ourselves as an international company able to move into the United States. We are the only Bahamian communications company in the United States today. According to the RFP, there will be fines if you do not meet a 1% drop call rate. How do you plan to meet that? Well, all of that comes into the uh, design of the network. We're designing a network so that obviously we don't want to have any drop calls, but we certainly will have less than 1% drop calls, provided, of course, that we're able to build our network. Um, it's very difficult if you're saying to someone that you need to meet a certain mandate, but you can't build the network in order to meet that specific mandate when we already know that the existing network is dropping so many calls on a daily basis. So uh, I think that's one of the challenges that, um, uh, that need to be addressed uh, with the regulator. Uh, how exactly is that going to work if there is, in fact, uh, sharing of, of network facilities in the country? Why would IRCA want BTC and Cable Bahamas to share the infrastructure? Some of the reasons that they have put forward is environmental concerns, uh, the, uh, the look of the towers because they're so tall, uh, things like that. Um, also to allow other entrants to enter the market very easily uh, and so on. Uh, it is a massive investment, there's no question about that. Uh, but there's also a payoff. There's also a large payoff. You, uh, you heard some of the numbers that I spoke about as high as maybe $140 million if you were to get 50% of the market. Um, and we believe at Cable Bahamas that we can. Uh, so we're willing to put the investment in in order to make that happen. What they're saying is that those people who are not willing or not able to make that investment should also be able to uh, come into the market. I don't know if I would agree with that assessment. Do we as Bahamians actually have a say in who is going to be our next provider or is it just going to be a government decision that we, you know, we could talk about but it's really not going to be heard? Um, every five years we have an election. We make decisions on who is going to be in office. We have a voice, Cable Bahamas probably, I mean, excuse me, the Bahamas probably has one of the largest per capita um, distributions of social media in the country, especially with Facebook. Uh, Twitter is pretty high as well. You have uh, people that, are, um, that have offices in your constituency. You can write letters to the editor. You can make a demand on what it is that you want. What do you think should happen? You can join the conversation on Facebook that's happening every single day about what is actually happening in the country. You can get engaged and say that, well, I'd like to know more about this. Why is this happening? Why is that happening? Why are rules coming up towards the end of the process when everyone knew from 2009 that we were going to liberalize the market? When everybody has already done their network designs, we get a spoiler towards the end that says, oh no, we, we have another plan, which means that everybody would have to go back and do all of their network designs all over again based on the new plan. So 
Uh, I believe that we do have a voice. Um, when Cable Bahamas has to go forward for a price increase, we have to go to a town meeting. But when the regulator is making changes, or when the regulator has things that they want to bring out, they don't hold town meetings on that. And this impacts our infrastructure. Our infrastructure impacts what we as Bahamians have. As I, as I said earlier in the presentation, the largest construction project in the Western Hemisphere is finalizing in New Providence now. Would that have been here had the infrastructure that Cable Bahamas brought in was not brought in? I think it's a very important question. When we brought that infrastructure in, we had challenges as well. They didn't want us to bring that in. The question is, do you influence the conversation in the market? I think you have your answer. <laughs>